Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. Again, we thank you for the time that we have together today in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you have shown us, you showed this church a long time ago, that where two or more are gathered in your name, there you are also. It's not just about um, us being here and talking about you as much as we hope that it's about us being here and talking to you and being with you, even as we're with your people. With that said, Holy Spirit, we know you are the reason that this becomes alive and it becomes real. And so I pray that you would anoint me to teach the word today, to empower me to communicate this from the heart of the Father through the blood of the Son. And I pray also that your Holy Spirit would be on the minds and the hearts of your precious people to see, perceive, to hear, to understand. And even beyond the words I speak today by the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak not simply the lessons from this passage, but to every issue, to everything in our life. We surrender all things to you, Lord. We want to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was, I was torn. It was a game-time decision as to whether I was going to continue in our series from Corinthians or teach uh, the traditional Palm Sunday message from, I don't know, Matthew 21 or somewhere like that. And uh, so I was thinking about it this week, and finally I came to the conclusion that um, I would just continue with the Corinthian series in context of Palm Sunday. And so what really leapt out uh, to me as I read over the narrative uh, this week that, that John read from Matthew 21, uh, normally the focus, of course, as it should be, is on Jesus and the power of the moment and the beauty of the moment and how it fulfilled the prophecy um, through his coming down and how these, these people like just were carried along by things they didn't understand to worship Jesus in this most appropriate way. But as I read it this year, uh, I thought about how these people like were propped up for the moment by the sovereignty of God, but they were nowhere near ready to receive Jesus. I mean, they were ignorant. They lacked anointed leadership. They didn't have the Holy Spirit, the cross hadn't happened yet, and even those that were the most loyal to Jesus were about to uh, either betray him or deny him or certainly keep their distance from him when he got in trouble, and, you know, they just weren't ready, and I don't think Jesus looked at them with contempt. I think he looked at them with pity and incredible love, and, and you know, if we'd been there, we'd have performed no better, Right? But the good news is that when Jesus comes again, when he comes the second time, he can find a church that isn't ignorant, that does have anointed leadership. As a matter of fact, has anointed people from the least to the greatest, that is washed in the blood, that is filled with the Holy Spirit, and that is ready to follow him, not perfectly, but faithfully and with strength beyond what is human uh, like never before. And so since he's coming soon, and that was the first coming or an aspect of the first coming and he's coming soon let's just go ahead and get ready for the second one in context the first one let's give him a let's give him a better moment when he comes the second time uh, we're in the midst of corinthians and and really if you just wanted to give an overarching statement of what god is doing here through the apostle paul he is basically calling the corinthian church those that are truly in christ uh, out of the world and into the kingdom of heaven uh and as far as how they think and act and feel, um, but having them continue to exist in the world for his, for his glory. So like the phrase we use in the church of a lot is in the church a lot is we need to be in the world, but not of it. Right. And unfortunately, many times we're in the world and of it, um, or we retreat to our compounds because we can't be in the world and not of it at the same time, right? We either go totally right or totally left, whichever way you want to think about it. But we really have a difficult time with that. And the Corinthian church was in the midst of the world. And actually, God wasn't saying to them specifically at that moment to go to the nations. The nations were coming to them because of their geographic location. But he wanted a bride there. He wanted a church there uh, to shine forth his grace, his beauty, and his holiness and, of course, at this point, they were falling far short of that. And so, as I've been saying all along, the name of the series isn't just Corinthians. It's Corinthians are us, U.S., right? And the city of Corinth was a lot like, it's been said, a lot like New York, L.A., and Las Vegas all mixed together. 
And unfortunately, the, the negative cultural attributes of those places um, was showing up also within the church. And so Paul is in the, the midst of calling that out and correcting it, um, but not doing it with a, a sense of condemnation but doing it with a sense of, hey, you know what? You've been washing the blood. Your sins are forgiven. You now have the Holy Spirit, and this is going to hurt a little bit, but not only do I have authority to kind of tear you down, and it's not me, but a Christ in me through the things I'm teaching, the power of God and the authority of God is also upon me um, and working beyond me to, to lift you back up. And so there's just this safety to be wrong for those who are truly born again um, but also this need to encounter the truth and be lifted back up. The word that came to me just uh, on Friday as I was preparing to teach this, and the one that I want to put front and center to you today, is the word agreement. Because I was thinking about the teaching, and it's pretty tough, and it's pretty heavy, and then I'm reflecting on my own life, like what it means to get a heavy word from God that I'm really not in a very good place emotionally, psychologically, whatever, even spiritually to receive and respond to, and it's like, man, I mean, I'm, I, maybe I could get to confession, but I'm, I don't think I got anything for repentance right now, and I won't ask you to raise your hand, but surely you're there, right? And what we do a lot of times in the church is we call confession repentance, but it's not, now, confession, earnest confession, leads to forgiveness, and forgiveness through the cleansing of our conscience absolutely could and should ignite repentance, but they're not really the same thing. And I'm not here to beat you up on that today. I'm here to say, um, let's start the process. This is going to take a little bit of time, <laughs> and it begins with agreement, agreeing that God is right and I am wrong on whatever issue the issue may be, like an agreement with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. By the way, it begins at the cross, right? I'm, I'm coming into agreement that Jesus is holy and righteous and good, that he perfected his body through obedience and offered it on the cross as a, as a substitute for my sin. So I'm in agreement that he is the Son of God, that he rose from the dead, and he didn't just do it for the world, he did it for me. I'm in agreement with that. That also means I, I agree that there, were, there are sins in me, upon me, that I've committed in the past, that I commit in the present, and that hopefully decreasingly I'll commit in the future, that have to be forgiven. And, and if that's true, and there's going to be any renewal of mind and transformation of heart, then, then at some point, after I've been washed in the blood and freed from my sins, he's going to go to work to prepare me as his bride, to clean me up through the teaching of his word. And like these things that are wrong, like he's going to start dealing with them, right? And and the very first thing I need to do when he starts dealing with them is just agree with them. When I used to get in trouble with my parents, like I would be in denial for a while. Eventually, I agree with them. By the way, then I would confess sometimes, but I had no intention to repent either. But agreement is the first step because that affects the mind. Ultimately, that will affect the heart. Ultimately, that will affect the words we speak. And ultimately, that will affect uh, the way we behave. Anyway, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. And I'm going to teach this in context, and then I'm going to kind of help us find ways to apply it to us, because some of, the, some of the context seems irrelevant, and it may be directly irrelevant, but it's indirectly it's, it's just as it should be. Uh, the Apostle Paul says this to that body. He says, if any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people. So Paul is in, in another place, in another town, and he's getting intelligence from one or two or a few people in Corinth of what's happening in the church there, and he's getting all these reports. I mean, last week we found out that he heard that some guy was sleeping with his dad's wife. I mean, it's bad. It's just, it's, you know, what I love about the Bible is it, it, it's kind of scandalous. A couple weeks, somebody was in here, and we were talking about sexual immorality or something, and they ran their kids back to kids' church. Should probably put, like, a plaque on the door. Like, it's at least PG-13, if not R, right? That's because we're in the Bible. And crazy, real, dirty, broken things happen 
in the scriptures, and no one's immune. I mean, Peter denied Christ before he was powerful in Christ. Noah got drunk and naked, right? I mean, you may say, Brian, how can you say that? It's in the Bible that we teach. It's just, there's this crazy, crazy stuff in the Bible. Well, in this particular case, this doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but to Paul, it's a big deal because if you look at the heart of the matter, it's a really big deal. And so there's a couple brothers, and, and I'm just reading between the lines here that have gotten mad at each other. And being that Corinth is such a business community, I imagine they were partners in business and, and they had a disagreement and they were fighting with each other and it was probably over money. It was over power or money. By the way, the title of today's message is Power, Money, and Sex in the Body of Christ. And so it was probably over power and it was probably over money and they couldn't figure it out and so they went to the local courts Rather than trying to resolve it among themselves and in, within the body of Christ, they took it to the local courts. And as was the culture at the time, as much as we love to talk about like lawsuits and who's suing who now and it's on news, especially if it's prominent people, like in the small, relatively small place of Corinth, like the people's issues became public issues when they went to court. This was done in a very public way. And, and the courts would probably sit from morning to night hearing cases. And so it would spread out. It was... It was public, it was scandalous, and, and it disgraced uh, the body of Christ. It made, it, it made the body of Christ indistinctive. Those people are just like us. Look at how much they hate each other. Look at how they steal from each other. Look how they are without mercy with each other. And they act like they have the answer through their God, but they come to us for the answer because they can't figure out their own problems. And, and it's, a, it's a disgrace. It literally takes the grace out of the body of Christ. And, and it's embarrassing. And, you know, and the Apostle Paul, as we're going to see in a minute, not only does the Apostle Paul take something like this and put it on the same level as sexual sin. I've always heard that the church's favorite sin is sexual sin. Like, it's the only one. It's not. There's many, and many of them are on the highest level, and they're all embedded with each other. Um, but... It's not. And, and he puts it on this equal platform, and it's even, we're going to see, it's like a gateway into many other things. But he's like, you're, you're embarrassing Christ because you can't deal with each other. The, the good news of the cross is that we can be made righteous, and the essence of righteousness is being in a right relationship with God that gives us the power, even if we're broken, to be in a right relationship with each other. And... And you're not. You're asking the world to mediate in your own affairs. Or do you not know, this is interesting, that the Lord's people will judge the world, not now, but later. And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Now, this could have been over $10 million, but it's trivial in the grand scheme of things, do you not know that he will judge, that, that we will judge angels, the fallen angels, not the righteous ones, how much more the things of this life? Now, this is interesting because just last week we were together and Paul said, it's none of my business to judge the world. My job is not to condemn, but to judge the church or to, to hold you accountable to the truth of God. And then here he's saying, wait a minute, we're going to judge the world. Well, in the future, in a sense, in some sense, we will judge the world because we will be heirs and joint heirs of Christ. And if he's judging the world, somehow we're embedded in him. And I think it's probably a really unhealthy truth to hold on to, but it's here, so we might as well deal with it. And we certainly aren't worthy to do that in our current form. We'll be worthy to do that in him. But the Bible also says that that Satan is being and will be ultimately entirely put under his feet. Well, if we're heirs and joint heirs with Christ, if the two are made one through, through marriage to the, the groom, which is Jesus, the bride of Christ with Jesus, then that means he is being put and under our feet as well. And, and already on, on earth, even before the full coming of the kingdom of heaven, like if we speak the words of God in alignment with the will of God, according to the spirit of God, then we have authority over demons, fallen angels, and circumstances even now. 
This is the powerful thing that we have in our midst that we barely tap into the potential of. And so Paul's like, like, that's who you will be. That's who you're becoming. And, and in Christ, through the Holy Spirit, you have the answer. You have the solution to every problem. You may not get there immediately, but you have the solution to every problem. You, have, you certainly have the theocratic solution to any conflict you have among yourselves, whether it be legal, financial, theological, doctrinal, what, personal, whatever. It, like You have the answer. So why would you people that are so dignified in Christ, been lifted up into the heavens, have the capacity that comes from God through the Holy Spirit, why would you go to people who don't have any of this to get a judgment in your own life. You have the answers, they have no answer. And not only is it a disgrace, it's like it's like lesser. It's like beneath you. And not in the sense that you should consider yourself superior superior in, in, in real terms to anybody because we're all just saved by grace. But at this moment, you have superior intellect through the power of the Holy Spirit working through the word of God, um, and maybe not by yourself, but in the community of God's people. Do you not realize what exists among you? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for ruling from those whose way of life is scorned by the church? Now, here's the thing, you know, preaching 101 says don't shame them, and then what does Paul do? I say this to shame you. (laughs) Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Really? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. Now, we don't, we don't do that much business with each other. I've done business with church brothers and have had conflict in the past, and it was ugly, but thank God we didn't take each other to court. Um, and we don't really, I mean, that's not our thing. Maybe one day if we're, our relationships developed in a powerful way, we would do business together, maybe. Maybe some of us, I don't know, whatever. But we do have relationships with each other, and we do have strife in our relationships with each other. And I can't tell you how many times we've had conflict in the church that somebody has ran down the street to another church and unloaded all their issues about this church and that church as if they were perfect. I mean, and it's just, it disgraces us in the body of Christ, but then it even leaks out beyond that. I mean, I've gotten text messages screenshotted and I mean, you can't, but we are a scandalous people. And why would anybody go there when that's how they treat each other, right? And when we have conflict, we don't run into the church. We run away from the church. That's what we do. When when somebody new comes to the church, and I mean, it's, it's kind of funny. When someone new comes to the church and they're like immediately super excited and fans. But I hear they had a little issue with their old church, Right? I know it's just a matter of time before they have an issue with me. And by the way, their issues with the old church might be legitimate. They just need to be resolved. And part of the resolution may be God placing you in a different body of believers, but this is what we do. We disgrace Christ through the body of Christ, and we act like we don't have the answers, and we do have all the answers. In terms of conflict, uh, Matthew's gospel teaches the very simple way that we can deal with conflict in the church. I'm going to tell you in a minute why I don't think it ever works for most of us. The first way, uh, the first thing we're to do is someone sins against us. And by the way, that's not just offending us. That's, we don't even get past event. We don't have, actually, the Corinthians may be superior to us in this. Our relationships are so superficial, we don't get beyond offense. Like, we're never in close enough relationship, we start losing each other's money. We just defend each other and we're gone. But the very first thing we're to do if someone offends us, if someone insults us or if someone hurts us, 
whether we it's a perceived sin, we feel like they sinned, or whether they really the very first thing is one of, like we're supposed to go. And I failed at this too, so I'm not trying to be self righteous here. The first thing we do is we go tell them, "Hey, man, this is what happened." The Bible says if they listen to us, go, "I'm sorry, man. You're right. Please forgive me." Whatever comes out of it, then it's resolved. It's done. And then if that doesn't work, then you get you grab one other person that both of you can trust and you have them mediate, maybe two other people, establish it with two or three, and you go and you try to you try again. And if it doesn't lead to resolution, then you bring it to the church. And and then if that doesn't lead to resolution, the church has to make a judgment of some sense. And if someone is an unrepentant, like offender, and that's according to the word of God and the spirit. I mean, if it's clear and they won't like like if you stole his money and you don't even want to acknowledge it, right? That's never happened, has it? Good. You'll never sit on the front row again. If you steal his money and you're not repenting, I'd be like, hey, man, I, God, please repent. Like your whole family sitting on the front row. Please, I need my front row people, right? Tell him you're sorry and try to make restitution. And if you didn't, I'd be like, man, you can't be here. That's terrible to say, right? By the way, he would never do that. He's a noble man letting me make a negative example out of him. Like, I don't... And by the way, you're going to go home and you're not going to feel the covering and the blessing and the fellowship. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be bitter. Like, just acknowledge it and come back. And if you're worried about how much money it is, don't, I'll, I will help you or we'll make him forgive you. Don't worry about it. It's not about the money. It's about the heart. Right? And so we, we work reconciliation. And, and how do we reconcile? We have to have a real reconciliation. Well, part of it is just acknowledgement, making some form of restitution if it's, if it's quantifiable. And, and you know where the, the biggest part of reconciliation comes from? It comes from forgiveness. Like, and here's the reason we're not willing to lose. We, we want to win and we want every penny back or every bit of uh, our dignity, like whatever we have lost in this offense, we want it all back and we want it all back right now. And sometimes the only way to balance the ledger is to forgive them. In, in my freshman year of college, my parents gave me a little bit of money every month, right? And, and they gave me a budget, and they said, this is what you need to spend, and this is what you need to make. And about once a quarter, we get together, and they would see I didn't make what I was supposed to make, and I spent way more than I was supposed to spend. And, and we couldn't reconcile our business deal. And the only way, honestly, that it ever got overcome is that my parents would forgive me in the sense of covering the, brand, the breach. And there was some level of contrition. I'm sorry, I agree, I did it. I'll work harder. I'll put a little money in there. But ultimately, this is not going to work if they're not willing to forgive. And that worked until my sophomore year. And they didn't forgive me anymore. They sent me out of their church, their house. But that's, that's how reconciliation happens. And then when you're reconciled, there can be restoration. Now, sometimes it's black and white. Sometimes it's not black and white. Sometimes you just got to be willing to forgive and to move on. And maybe the relationship can't be what it used to be, but it can be what it's going to be in the future, and there can be some level of restoration. Anyway, we have the wisdom to do that, right? We can do that here. Or we can run out there, and we can fight our wars like the world does. We can disgrace Christ, uh, the body of Christ. We can grieve the Holy Spirit that lives in us and with, within us as a community, and he will never leave us or forsake us, but he'll sure go quiet for a while and, and let us see what it looks like to live on our own. And so we have the answers. We know how to do this. And we do it, in, we do it sometimes in the midst of families, in the midst of marriages, very carefully in a very different way, but we, we're here to work out our righteousness with fear and trembling, and our righteousness is a right relationship with God and each other. He, he says in the next verse, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. Multiple lawsuits here. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? 
Instead, you yourselves in retaliation cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers and sisters in Christ, I would add. So the secret to making a relationship working long-term, in case you didn't notice, those of you who have been married or don't want to kill your kids, even though you have those moments, right, is the willingness to lose. Like, in this case, it seems like it's about money. It's like the willingness to lose money. Like, why would not rather lose money than create this kind of division, animosity, scandal, and disgrace in the body? Like, why not? I mean, if you're in a right relationship with God because you're bestowing grace as he's bestowed it to you, and you're not that confident in yourself anyway. Like, there's a way I see these circumstances, but maybe I'm just not right about that. I mean, I'm very self-centered. But you maintain that, that tether you have to the Spirit of God and the, the flame of God that burns brightly inside of you, which is, by the way, it may seem intangible, but it's the greatest asset any of us will ever have. If we keep the Holy Spirit alive and well, the fan the flame fan inside of us, like what are we worried about? You understand that you have living inside of you that which spoke the world into existence. Created order, created something out of nothing, ex nihilio, the, the Latin term. And that lives inside of you, that creativity, that power, that energy, that ability to be dignified, that ability to be restored, that ability to be renewed, even if you've been this great victim, that ability to go make more wealth, like that's the partnership that you want. And why not rather be wronged out here and keep that right? We, including me, are a very stubborn and prideful people that insists that our way is the way and we insist we win. And the only way to reconcile with us is to bow at our feet. And if you don't bow at our feet, then we're going to come after you with everything we got. We're going to make you pay. That is the way of the world that bleeds into the church. Sometimes we dress it up in appearances, but oh, oh my gosh, the veiled threats that are made in the body of Christ. Because I'm going to win. I'm a winner. Ricky Bobby. You ain't first, you're last. Why not rather be treated? Uh, here's going back to verse 7. The fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. Now, that, this is getting heavy. By the way, we're about to get in, back into... It's a power, money, and sex sermon, so we're going, you knew we were going to get back into the sex stuff at some point. He says, you're already completely defeated. In other words, you're not just defeated in this narrow category among a few people that are fighting with each other. A little yeast works through the whole batch... And not only are you corrupted in that way, you're corrupted in, now you're, now you're corrupted in every way. Like once you've given him a foothold, he's taken over the whole house. And, you know, we say it all the time, you, we don't sin in a vacuum. In other words, my sin will affect other people. Right? I mean, if I, if I sin, and I think it's a private sin, and it doesn't hurt anybody, and it's none of their business, and I'm, a, and I'm an adult, and that's not hurting anybody, well, the truth is the wages of sin are death, and death bleeds. Sin also doesn't have a, happen in a vacuum in the sense that if I just sin in this category, that, mean, that doesn't mean I'm sinning in all these other categories. No, it, it bleeds. The, the fighting for power and the fighting for money will lead to sexual immorality. Sexual immorality will lead to greed and will lead to ambition. Like all this stuff, it's a cesspool of hell. If you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And don't tell me because I'm washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Spirit that this can't happen to me. You may not be able to be possessed by evil, but you can be oppressed by evil. And just look at history and how some of the greatest men and women of God have fallen when their vanity and their pride became so large. Uh, James chapter 3, we're going to deviate just for a moment because this is an important concept. Who is wise and understanding among you? 
James is the book where James just basically, he, he, even more than Paul, stood flat-footed and told these people exactly what was wrong with them. Uh, let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, so let's say pride and ambition and greed and all those kind of things in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, and wait for it, demonic. Where you have envy, pride, selfish ambition, greed, you don't just have that. There you find disorder in every evil practice. If you give them an inch, you'll take a mile. If, you, if we let offense settle in our heart and mind and we're bent on redemption and, and victory and vengeance and all those things, or if we just get up on Monday morning and we're like, I'm going to go make as much money as I can and I don't care who gets hurt in the way. Uh, quoting scripture, going to church, filled with pride, filled with ambition, dressing it up in zeal for God, and we know it's not. It's just worldliness. It, it's a gateway to all these other things. Not me. I don't say so. The Bible says so. When, when we give him a foothold, he takes the whole thing. And it may not be possession, but it most certainly is oppression. And here's the thing about Satan. Once the darkness comes in, like, it, it, it takes it all. It leads to an array of ungodly things. We see someone behaving in this way or we are, see our own, our own selves behaving in that way. D did you know that, yeah, it's, it's earthly and it's unspiritual because, you know, we're not with the spirit at that moment or maybe it's an unbeliever and they've never had the spirit. But did you also know that it's demonic? It's interesting that I had this experience this week. I wasn't sure I was going to tell about it, but I'm going to tell about it. I got a problem that I don't filter to your benefit and my shame. Anyway, this week I, I, I was in, I've been in a dynamic in my business life where I didn't realize it, but I've been, I've been, I had gotten into a power struggle. And... Um, I didn't really understand it. I was confused by it, and I was legitimately offended. And one thing led to another, and I, before I knew it, I was just—it was really starting to bother me. And um, and I, I finally, instead of, you know, it was pride, it was ambition. It hadn't become sexual immorality, but if I'd stayed in it, that's where I probably would have ended up, right? That's what the Bible says. And so finally, I mean, I just quit fighting the battle. I thought that I was fighting righteously. I was that confused, and I just, I just slowed down, and I felt like I was, I was just like, God, I'm just turning. To, I just got to turn to you right now. You know, on the surface, everything was great. My business was still going well, but I mean, I just had this little internal struggle, and I said, God, I just turned to you right now. And so the Lord took me to Psalm 23, and He said, and it says, "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." I didn't need to go any further. And that word, that truth supplanted all the lies and it freed me from the pride and the greed that I'd gotten caught up in at that time. And I went back into those same circumstances and they hadn't changed, but I had and I didn't care. I was surrendered, I was free. And the best way I can describe what I experienced just this very week is like deliverance. And I don't believe that Satan or demons or anything can infiltrate the inner sanctum of my being because I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. But he sure can get a hold of my mind and my heart. He can oppress me. He can cling to me. If I give him room, he'll take it. And boy, but I mean, one phrase from Almighty God and poof, it's gone. And you know what it goes back to? It goes back to the willingness. Like, I don't need to win. I'm willing to lose. And so... That demonic oppression or possession 
will drive us into any manner of sins. It's a gateway. So Paul makes the transition. Why not rather be cheated instead? You yourselves cheat, right? That's, that's where we came from. And now back to verse 9. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he who started a work will sustain it and will finish it in us, right? So if we really are born again in Christ, then we will ultimately inherit the kingdom of God. He will present us before his throne without blemish or fault. So that's done. Now, if you're not in Jesus, like us, this is who you are, but you have no chance of true repentance because don't feel bad about this. It's only the spirit of God inside of us that causes us to will and act according to his good purposes. So run to Jesus Receive what he did for you on the cross. He will most certainly wash you, clean you, pick you up, and begin to change your life. Not perfectly, not instantly, but like us, you'll be on the long path to recovery. And you too will have that internal, eternal assurance that the work will get done and you can inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul's not writing this, and I'm not teaching this, to cause those of us who know that we belong to Christ to fear that because we made a mistake last week, we're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven, because you are. But we also know that the kingdom of heaven, the coming of the kingdom of God, is not just about what happens then, it's about what is happening now. And we talk all the time about wanting to be under the covering, under the blood, under the blessing, under the power, under the potency, the creativity, the energy, the purity, the joy, the peace and joy that surpasses all understanding. Like all these, like we want to stay in that. We want to inherit that. We want to inherit it on earth even before the full coming of the kingdom of heaven. It can be ours right now. In my ministry with you, in the work that I do in the marketplace, I ultimately want it under the blessing of the kingdom of God, according to the will and purposes of God. My king spoke. He said, let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm your shepherd. I'm leading you, and you ain't going to want. But if you become this, if you become prideful and ambitious and you start fighting your wars in this world the way the people do then you will live by that sword and you will also die by that sword and you cannot inherit the promise that i've already just made you because that's in the kingdom that's not there choose this day who you will serve you cannot serve god and money that doesn't mean you can't go make money for the glory of god your family and your church it does mean that you can't submit to both uh, at that moment i had two masters one was money in the world and one was god once god said i'll give you the money i'm like well the heck with that i'm going to god i'm submitting to him i trust in his ability to graciously give me all that i need and all that he wants to give me more than I trust in my ability to go earn it for myself in the world. You tracking me? And oh, by the way, if I don't repent there in ways that seem plausible and okay, still having the appearance of being a man or woman of God, before you know it, I'll be doing all this crazy sexual stuff. Like they're connected. It's weird. Sometimes the Bible's weird, but it's truthful. <laughs> like, isn't it funny? I'm just thinking about this out loud. I'm in a weird place today. Hope you can hang with me. Like, all the strip joints in New York City and Washington, D.C. and around the world, the brothels, whatever, are filled with business people. Almost seems like maybe that ambition and that greed lead to lust. Hmm. I've heard that somewhere. Where? Oh, James 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 11, 
And that's what you were. That's who you used to be. That's not who you are now. It's what you're still doing. It's what you still look like. But that's what you were. But that's not who you are anymore. You were washed in the blood of Jesus, I would add. You were sanctified and are being sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus by his sacrifice on the cross. And you are being justified by the Spirit of our God. You were called and you were blessed and you were forgiven and you were indwelled by the Holy Spirit and you have been lifted up into the heavenly. Like, that's who you are now. I know we forget, but that's who you are. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The reality is that's who you are. It is most certainly who you're becoming. But at the same time, we're in this world and sometimes of it. And oh, by the way, and let's just talk about it a little bit. We're surrounded with imposters. people in the body of Christ who would bring us a word from God that appealed to our pride and our ambition and our vanities rather than to the spirit that exists inside of us. It's who you were, but in reality, we're working this salvation out. It is most certainly who we will ultimately be. Then he, then he gets into, so this church seemed to really, they loved grace, and who doesn't, right? But they used grace to the point um, of licentiousness. It was always, they were always boasting in their freedom. And, and that might be like a real, that might have been a tendency in the ancient world because, so we're Gentile believers. We've never really liked these Jews and all their rules and how superior they seem to us. And they're cutting themselves up and they're keeping their commands and they're giving it tenth of their money and they're doing all these things and oh man what a great thing that jesus came and basically said it's all rubbish because it's not inspired by god it's just religion it's self-righteousness and so the tendency can be because we're not that to go to the other extreme and go Woo, we don't have to do anything we can do whatever we want and so he, he gets into their doctrine and theology a little bit that led them to this place where they found it plausible to be this worldly and this lost and yet at the same time think they were okay with God. And so he quotes them. He says, he says I have the right to do anything. He's speaking on their behalf. He's imagining what they would say to him or probably what they've said to him in the past or what he's heard they've been saying to each other, which is they have the right to do anything in Christ, right? Uh, the other way to interpret that word right is freedom. I have the freedom to do anything. I have a right to do anything. You, don't, you can't tell me what to do. He says, yeah, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. That's at him adding his words. Like you're telling me you have the freedom to do whatever you want, and if I, I don't really think that's what freedom is, but if we accept that just for a moment, like then why are you always getting in these terrible, why are you dealing with consequences? Like you're basically saying to me, uh, I know the Bible says that the wages of sin are death, but because I'm in Christ, uh, it ain't gonna kill me. And you look around and you go, yeah, but you're in this, like you can't keep dealing with the same deadly consequences as everybody else. You lose money, you lose relationships, you lose your sanity, you lose your power. Like, okay, I get, I get if you want to live according to that credo, fine, but it's, I'm looking at your life and I'm basing it on my own experience. Like, it doesn't work. It doesn't. I have the right or the freedom to do anything, you say. And Paul adds, but I will not be mastered by anything. And so he's, he's just kind of mocking the idea that freedom would lead to bondage. I'm, I'm free to drink, I'm free to eat, I'm free to take drugs, I'm free to do this and that. But, you know, all those sins lead to addiction and addiction leads to being dominated like you're in bondage. So you're in bondage and you're doing and you're dealing with the consequent like you're in a cycle of sin and death you you're counting on having eternal life but your life is a mess right now and as the scripture says like you're not going to inherit the kingdom of god no maybe then but not now and i have to ask this too i would ask this i would say maybe you should test yourself and see if you really are in this faith now, it's entirely possible that you're this moronic and ignorant and you're doing these things and you're dealing with all these consequences 
and, and you're in Christ, and ultimately the crisis will lead to surrender. I mean, he'll finish what he started. But maybe you're not even like, may, are you here? Are you even here? Hmm. Like, was that real? You say food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. This is kind of a Gnostic thing. Like, I, I'll do whatever I want with my body. How bad can it be? God's going to kill my body. It's only my soul or my spirit that's going to live on forever, right? So I can eat what I want. I can drink what I want. I can sleep with who I want. I can do all these things. That's all in the flesh. My spirit's over here in a different category. They're not tethered together in any way. And so it's kind of a Gnostic idea that I'll, I'll eat, I'll do, I'll feed my desires and my uh, ambitions and all my things, and, and God will destroy them both, but I will live on spiritually forever. That's, that's their gospel. And then Paul says, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Verse 14, he reminds them of this, and this is not no small thing. By his power, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead. And he will raise us also. Like, we're going to get a new body. That's good news, right? But he's going to make it out of the old body. Did you know that? He's going, we're going to literally resurrect from the dead. If you've been cremated, all the atoms of your being will come back to God. I don't know. It's going to be a miraculous thing. We're going to go up and to meet our Lord in the sky. And then he's going to take that which is old and make it new. He's going to transform these sacred bodies we already have into something eternal and glorious. There'll be a new heavens, a new earth, and new glorious people on them, but it will be the old made new. He didn't waste things. He's really good at recycling. And even if, by the way, um, I ascribe to this idea, it doesn't matter because it's all going away, even if that was true, you understand that we were created in the beginning in the image of God. And these ears and the nose and your eyes, dare I say it, your sexual organs, your ability to reproduce, they were never, ever meant for perversion or corruption. They were meant for the glory of God and your enjoyment and sacred relationships with him and each other, specifically a man and a woman, a spouse. They were created for the glory of God and for his purposes, and if Christ who created us came to recreate us, and he wants us to begin to experience the kingdom of heaven on earth before heaven, then he wants to start redeeming these bodies right now too. And that whole agent, like, it, I'm telling you, Corinthians are us. I feel like 10 years ago I would have preached this and said it was a lot worse there than us, but we have a lot of this like, no, we, we, we're there. <clears throat> you'll, you'll barely find an ancient culture that had, was doing anything worse than what we're doing. Yeah, but they sacrifice babies, so do we. Homosexuality, running rampant. Hmm. Transgenderism, all day long. Not only do we know it, uh, in many ancient cultures they knew it was wrong, they just couldn't help themselves. We don't even always know that it's wrong anymore. And if you're, a, if you're a New Testament gospel preacher, you may not, and you've fallen away maybe in the great apostasy, and you may not know, uh, you may not use the words that the Corinthians were using, but somewhere in the heart, anyone who's preaching the gospel and not requiring obedience or not at least requiring agreement to the truth, like basically what they're saying is like, that's all going away. It's going to be okay in the end. It's this. It's... A lack of understanding. 
So your bodies that you're in right now will be raised up, transformed, and made glorious. Do you not know that your bodies already are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? And then he screams, never. I mean, that's the logical end of your, of your beliefs. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. You know, We never sin within a vacuum. In other words, our sin always affects others. We never sin within a vacuum in the sense we can't stay in one category of sin and think it won't spread to other categories of sin. And we never sin in a vacuum in the sense that what is happening in our flesh is not happening in our mind, our heart, our soul, and our spirit too. And when a man and woman were brought back together in the garden and when they come back together through marriage, and they're together, they're intimately together. It's not just that their bodies are being tethered together, their mind is being tethered together, our hearts are being tethered together, our soul and our spirit are being tethered together. Any of us who have been married, a healthy sex life is an incredibly important part of marriage because there's so, I mean, it's like a sacrament in itself. I know this is getting weird, but like sometimes. You don't have sex because you're not communicating well, but sometimes you're not communicating well because you haven't had sex. There is something that bonds us through this intimate act that God created us for that we shouldn't be ashamed of. Paul's like, you shouldn't get married. Just serve the Lord. We're like, whatever. (laughs) That's your problem, right? So it affects everything. And sexual sin affects it more than any other sin. And so not only, here's, this will get kind of crazy. Not only does this intimacy exist between us and our husband or our wife, it can exist between us and whoever we slept with. In some sense, it's a commingling of those things, whether we wanted that or not. We thought we could stay in this category, but we didn't. But for those of us who are washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Spirit, we have the Spirit of Christ living in us, and and that means that the Spirit in Christ in us bonds with the Spirit of Christ in them, which is phenomenal, but when it's perversion, it's like, it's a debasement. It's It's an abomination. And so, verse 17, whoever is united with the Lord is one with him, in spirit. And, and we're inviting darkness and evil into that inner sanctum. And it all started with somebody who cheated us out of $55. Power, money, sex. Nothing new under the sun No sin except that which is common to man. We can't play around with sin and not go down the same slippery slope that everybody else has gone down their entire lives. Now, the good news is the cross is sufficient. We'll make sure that we understand that. With all this in mind, and because these sins have been forgiven, now we are given the command, flee from sexual immorality, like run like mad. Don't just refrain, run from it. All other sins a person commits are outside of our body, but whoever sins sexually sins against and in their own body, in the body of Christ. And it even infiltrates into the inner sanctum of the the one that we're, we're living in a sacred marriage with. Flee from pornography. Flee from rust, imagina- lust, imaginations, adultery. Don't play around with it. Don't entertain it. Run from it. Don't think you're too sanctified for it. We, another story about me in New York. Isn't that funny? It's like God has me in New York for these sermons. 
it was at what lighting show this week and we went to different parties for the lighting show and it was fun we we're having a good time and then we went to our, our last party for one of our vendors and we go in there and they have they have strippers who aren't stripping this is like a legitimate company party i'm like those girls dancing up there are dancing. I don't know. I, you know, I'm a pastor. I don't know. But it seems like they might be stripping, but they're not stripping. And, and my boss, the president of our company, like he's with me. We looked up there, and then a guy came out, and he was stripping without stripping. And we just, wait, we, ran, we fleed. <laughs> what the heck was that? I'm like, I don't even want to sell their lights anymore. All they re represent is darkness. Flee. It's sin against God, it's sin against you, and it's sin against those you love the most. And for those of you who aren't married, you're already sinning against the spouse you will have one day who's probably already sinning against you. And anybody who's been married and, and, and tries to come into this sacred thing, like our past follows us, doesn't it? God redeems it and he lifts us out of it, but it hurts us. Because it interferes with that intimacy and those are the consequences. And we can, good news, the grace of God is sufficient uh, to bring us out of that, but man, we got we got to get out of that. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own; you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And then he might have add, added, and don't think that you're spiritually okay when you're not physically okay or materially okay as well because power leads to the greed for money and leads to lust and sexual immorality and there's nothing new that's that's who we are that's where we are and jesus is saying i want a bride without blemish when i return i want people who don't just honor me with their lips but honor me with their hearts their life and their lifestyle i don't need perfect people but i do need faithful people Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Which one are we going to feed? Are we going to feed the spirit of God that exists inside of us with the word of God, with the knowledge of God? Or are we going to feed our flesh with all the things that are happening in the world? The one we feed will grow and will trump the other one. What is being a disciple? It's honing in to the voice of God and the spirit of God to the exclusion of anything else. We are not disciples because God cares that we didn't eat, that we, didn't, that we fasted or we spent 10 hours on our face. We're disciplined so that we can feed our spirit and overcome our flesh. And the cross is absolutely sufficient. The blood of Jesus Christ given for us, the perfect blood of Christ, washes over our life and speaks a better word even when we're in a dark place and God brings forgiveness. And when we come into agreement and we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We should be having communion today. We'll do it a couple times next week. And then upon that clear conscience, he imparts the Holy Spirit, indwells the Holy Spirit that gives us the ability to think, to hear, to see, perceive, to, to understand, and to apply the truths of God into our life, to will and act according to his good purposes. Gives us the power, ever increasingly, not perfectly, to live for him. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know what I want? I want a bride without blemish. You know when I want her in eternity? No, I want her right now. Because I want, I, not only for me, the Lord might say, but for her, for her dignity and her peace and her joy and her authority on earth even before heaven. I want her, boys and girls in here, men and women, the body of Christ, he wants us to be moving in this place so that we can begin to inherit the kingdom of heaven even right now on earth before then because when we have when we have power and wealth and intimacy with god and intimacy with one another when we can invert what has been perverted back to what it was originally meant to be then we will have extraordinary power on this earth to glorify him and bring people into the kingdom of heaven and there are no shortcuts this is how we do it let's pray heavenly father we love you we praise you we thank you for your word we thank you for your spirit we come into agreement with you today that your word is true. Genesis to Revelation, every single bit of it is true. We may not always get the right interpretation, but ultimately when we do, it is absolutely true. 
And, and may it, may you tell the truth and all of us be a liar. We come into agreement with you on your ideas about power, your ideas about wealth, your ideas about intimacy. your laws that were built around these things. We may not be able to repent yet. We may be too broken to repent, but we agree. We, we submit to it as truth. We ask for forgiveness. We confess. And we anticipate and we hope in the power of the Holy Spirit to renew our minds, to transform our hearts, and to change what we say and to change what we do. We need you to do it in us, and we need you to do it for us, but we know what we have to do today is we have to agree. First and foremost, God, we agree that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins. I pray that my words would be someone else's words, maybe a few people's words here today, and, and for the first time, we are confessing that you are the one and only Son of God, that you were a perfect man, who gave his perfect life for my imperfect life. You didn't just die for the world or the church, you died for me. And immediately your blood covers me. I know that to be true. Somehow mysteriously through the Holy Spirit, I know that to be true and I'm asking for your Holy Spirit to fill me. We agree with that. We also agree that we sinned and fallen short of your glory. Otherwise the cross wouldn't have been necessary. We agree with that. And third, Lord, we want to be agreeable on every issue. Can't always fix it, but we can agree with it, and we can trust you for the outcome. Renew our mind, transform our heart, change our lives, draw us close to you and to each other, create a pure bride without blemish that has the dignity, the peace, the joy, and the power to glorify you on earth right now as it shall ultimately be. In Jesus' name. Amen.